Apes are fractionally limited resolution barrier in a light focusing fluorescence microscope. For this accomplishment, he has received several awards. He most recently shared the 2014 Kepley Prize in Nanoscience and was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. ISCOM's 2016 is proud to present Professor Stephen Hell. Thank you very much for introducing me so nicely. It's a great pleasure to be here. There's one thing that I would like to add uh, to the introduction. Actually, my first scientific presentation ever uh, I gave in the Netherlands. And so um, I'm very attached um, to the scientific tradition of this country, not only because it has a huge history in microscopy, uh, but also it is tightly linked to, uh, to my personal history as a scientist. And as we've heard, um, I'm going to give you a mixture about what I've done, so what I actually made me famous, and um, uh, about uh, how, what decisions I took in life in order that these things happened in the end. Now, I'm sure that every one of you is familiar with the saying, a picture's worth a thousand words, or seeing is believing. And this not only applies to our daily lives, it definitely applies also to the uh, natural sciences. Because if you can see something, then we understand it much better and we can get a better comprehension of how things work. And therefore, it's not a coincidence, I think that uh, the beginning of the natural sciences as we know them today very much coincides in history with the invention of the, of the light microscope. I'm thinking about Anthony van Leeuwenhoek and, and Robert Hook in, in England. And so the invention of the light microscope made a decisive difference. Because with light microscopy, mankind was able to see for the first time that every living being consists of cells as uh, basic uh, units of structure and function uh, with uh, light microscopy, bacteria were discovered, uh, subcellular organelles such as mitochondria, and so on. Um, however, um, you've just heard it, I'm sure, uh, the same fate uh, applied to basically anyone here. Um, we learned in school, uh, definitely um, at, uh, at university, that the resolution of a light microscope is fundamentally limited to about half the wavelengths of light. So if you want to see things that are smaller than about 200 nanometers, it's not possible. You can't really tell them apart because the details are too small and you cannot see it really. Now for that reason, the electron microscope was invented in the beginning, in the middle of the 20th century, and there is no doubt about the fact that by resorting to electron beams rather than light beams, electron microscopy attained a much higher spatial resolution. In a number of cases, you can have a resolution that goes down to the size of a molecule or the size of an atom, or even better. And therefore, the question comes up, why do we still care uh, for the light microscope now that we have the electron microscope and, and uh, electron microscopy is, is much better in terms of the ability to see small things? Now, the answer is given actually in a little experiment that I've made a couple of years back. Um, I've taken this journal that many people like to publish in uh, because it reports about uh, important advancements in the, in the field of basic medicine. <laughs> And I count the number of studies, the number of papers in which uh, a light microscope is used and those where an electron microscope is used. And you see which of the two won. Um, and this is still representative uh, today. Um, light microscopy is, still is the most popular microscopy technique in the life sciences. And there are two strong reasons for that. Now, the first reason is that it's the only way, light microscopy, the only way by which we can look into the, um, the interior of a living cell. Because light is capable of penetrating into a cell and extracting information um, uh, from the cell uh, because light is kind of gentle to the cell and you can work minimally basic if you use just focus visible light. This is not the case for electrons. Uh, electrons get stuck usually in electron microscopy after dehydrate the sample um, and so on or have to use a vacuum. But that's not the only reason. There is another strong reason why light microscopy is so popular. It's indicated already in here. I mean, there are diff thousands of different proteins or lipids and, and so on um, in, in a cell, different types of molecules. And we know by now that there are mitochondria, we know there is an endoplasmic reticulum and so on, but we do not really know uh, what a certain type of protein, a protein species, 
is actually doing at a certain point in time, or where it's located. And that can be done much, much easier in a light microscope uh, in comparison to electron microscopy, because in light microscopy, we can highlight a certain protein species, for example, by attaching a fluorescent molecule to it. So that means that uh, a, so a fluorophore, that's a fluorescent molecule, organic molecule, could also be a, say, something that is expressed by the cell, like a green fluorescent protein, is attached to the protein of interest. Then you have something like a, an indicator of that particular protein. Uh, so it means um, uh, that if you shine light on a, on a cell that is labeled, where a certain type of protein is labeled, the molecule can absorb a photon, for example, a, a, a light particle of, of green light, and then the molecule is raised to a high lying state, an excited state. And then uh, the molecule um, uh, comes down from this excited state to the ground state by emitting a fluorescent photon, by emitting fluorescent light. Now, because um, some of the energy that is absorbed here um, through the photon actually is lost in the, mo in the motion of the atoms. The fluorescent light is shifted in wavelengths. It has a lower energy um, uh, photon emission, so it's redshifted in wavelengths. That means that the fluorescent light has a different wavelength, has a dis different color as compared to the light with which you illuminate the cell, with which you excite the cell. And therefore, um, fluorescence microscopy is extremely sensitive. So you can very easily detect uh, proteins in here with very good signal to background ratio simply because um, the fluorescent light can be easily uh, selected out of the, uh, of the remaining light. And that makes the method extremely sensitive. In fact, fluorescence microscopy is so sensitive that you can detect just a single molecule in a cell um, uh, and, and, and signal out that molecule, that labeled molecule, of course, from the rest of the cell, because fluorescence is so, is so sensitive and so, so, so uh, easy to, 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 to suppress background. Now, as I said, it's single mole uh, sensitive, it's molecule sensitive, but if there is a second molecule, a third molecule, a fourth molecule, and so on, coming very close to that first molecule, closer than, the, say, half the wavelength of light, so the resolution limit of light microscopy, the light microscope is not capable of telling them apart. So what I'm saying by this is that resolution is, a, is um, about telling features apart. It's not about just the sensitivity of something, it's about the ability to distinguish features that come very, very close together and, um, and, and are very densely packed in space. And so you can imagine, because of this limit, of resolution in light microscopy, light microscopy had a severe problem. You couldn't see details that are beyond that scale. And although you have the sensitivity, in principle you can detect single molecules, but if they are too densely packed, you cannot see the detail. And so it's very obvious that if one manages to overcome this barrier and, um, and come up with a light microscope, especially a fluorescence microscope, that has a much higher spatial resolution that would have um, uh, profound impact in the life sciences because one could see things, for example, in viruses or so, um, that you couldn't see before, and you could see proteins specifically. Okay, now um, you may ask now, what is the reason why you cannot distinguish things that are smaller than 200 nanometers? I'm not going to talk much about physics, but a bit of physics I have to tell you, and you will see it's very, very simple. Not only it's simple, it's also profound. So this is the best way of explaining in general. Well, you can say that the most important element or the most important piece, component of a light microscope is the lens, is the so-called objective lens. And the role of this objective lens is nothing but to focus the light in space. You focus the light down to a point, as I'm showing you here. So here the lens is shown schematically. But because light propagates as a wave, as we've been told, it's not possible for the lens to concentrate the light just on a single geometrical focal point. It's impossible to generate just a tiny, tiny sharp spot of light. Because of this wave nature of light, the lens will rather produce um, a spot of light of minimum extent that is at least 200 nanometers wide and about 500 nanometers in this, in this direction. It's tightly connected with the wavelength, actually, and this minimum extent cannot be made small. So that's, that's what it is. And so this is a spot of light that is produced here in the focal region as a result of the fact that light propagates as a wave. And this, say, consequence, or this physical fact, 
that um, the spot of light is always finite has, of course, a major impact on the resolution capability of the light microscope because it means that if you're having several features here falling within this spot, within this range, the features will automatically be flooded with excitation lights, like with this green light at the same time. There's no way out. You see, we have, let's assume, vesicles or molecules or something in here. They will all be flooded at the same time with light. And because they're flooded at the same time with light, of course, they will also produce light at the same time, fluorescent light at the same time. They will scatter fluorescent light back at the same time. And so, if you want to, if you collect that light that is produced uh, uh, by these molecules in here, and then you see it's the yellow light, the fluorescent light is produced here, and image it back onto a detector, like your eyepiece or something like that in a detection plane, the same thing will happen, of course. The light will be focused, we will also get a blob of light in here that has a finite extent, so the light coming from this molecule, and but the next molecule will produce the same thing. And the next molecule, the next, another one, another one. And you see, because they are so close and the spots are so large, they, they all overlap in space. And if you put a detector in here, or your eyes, or the eyepiece, or so, it's not possible for any detector to tell the signal from these molecules apart. Even if you put a camera in here, for example, a CCD camera, and with some pixelated detectors, it won't help because the, the light blocks that are produced by each of the molecules in space will overlap. Now, there were several people actually in the 19th century who realized this problem. Um, Abbe was not the first, um, but, uh, but he was the man who really, he was the person who really made the world aware of it and said, okay, there's a serious problem we have to, and, and we want to overcome it. That's what he believed, um, uh, at least. Um, he, he coined this diffraction resolution barrier, as it's called formally, in an equation that is named after him. So this is Abbe's equation. It's basically saying, and this is Abbe, in order to be separable, two features of the same kind have to be further away than the wavelengths, that's lambda, divided by the so-called numerical aperture of the objective lens. So this is, this is a, the sign of the opening angle, and the index of refraction is a number like two. And since this number never gets larger than three or so, and the wavelength is something like 500 nanometers or 600 nanometers, you end up with the 200 nanometers, and that's the end of the story. I'm sure you've heard about this equation, you learn about this equation um, in, in your basic medicine studies. Everyone has to learn about this resolution limit. Um, and uh, you find this equation basically in any textbook of physics, optics, uh, but also a textbook for the natural sciences because the enormous relevance of light microscopy to this field. And you will also find it on a memorial. It's not his tombstone, actually, but it's a memorial that was erected in Ernst Abbe's honor. So this is the Physiology Institute um, of the University of Vienna in Germany, where he lived and worked. And this is his equation, so to speak, written in stone. And this is what people believed throughout the 20th century. So throughout the 20th century, physicists thought, and of course not only physicists, that you won't get beyond this resolution barrier. And if you want to see details in a light microscope, they have to be further away than this distance d. Um, given by the wavelengths and, and this divided by this little number here, like three, and then that's the end of the story. And not only people believed it, this is also quite important, it was a fact. So when I was a student um, in Heidelberg um, at the end of the 80s, um, I studied actually um, the use of a so-called confocal microscope, which is a modern version of the light microscope. And this is the best resolution that one could get at that time. Um, with that and still with that system. Um, if, for example, if you image um, for, uh, like uh, fibers in a, in a cell like dementin or microtubules or actin or something like that. And you see, you don't see much. You have, you have a significant blur. And now that we can do it much better. So this is done now, uh, this is a comparison image done with a method I have developed, stat microscopy, which I will talk about. Uh, in a few minutes, and as a result of this development, one could see that, yes, you can overcome this barrier, and you can see details much better now than you could see before, simply because um, uh, there is physics, so to speak, in this world, or physical chemistry, depending on which angle you have, that, that allows you to get beyond the barrier and to see details that are, are much, much sharper. And of course, this discovery that you can overcome this barrier and see details much sharper, 
um, um, contrary to what people have believed and, and what was the case, has had a number of consequences. And you heard about it in a little, about its consequences already in the trailer. And the consequence happened to me not very long time ago, say uh, one and a half years ago. I had the privilege of meeting uh, Northern European kings. <laughs> And the first king that, that I met was King Harald V of Norway. Um, so um, he hands out a uh, quite important prize in the area, in the area of nanoscience, a couple prize, and the privilege of, of sharing it with two colleagues. Uh, and uh, uh, so this comes with a scroll, it comes with a medal. And six weeks afterwards, after he had handed out this prize, I was called by the Swedish Academy uh, and they told me basically that I would have uh, the privilege of meeting another king, this time uh, the king of Sweden, uh, sharing uh, the Nobel Prize in this time with his uh, two colleagues. And uh, again, it comes with a very nice scroll and um, uh, with, a, with a very nice medal. And um, the whole, um, say, festive ceremony is followed by, by a banquet, which looks like this, um, uh, with excellent food, I should say, <laughs> um, and with very noble company. <laughs> and um, but I'm sure you're not interested in this type of gossip, or so you want to know uh, 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 how this microscope works. <laughs> and so I come back to that. <laughs> well, so the question comes up now, why can we overcome this barrier? So why can we take this picture and in the past such similar pictures were not possible? Um, I think, um, this is my personal belief, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many, many cases, a certain discovery is very tightly connected to a certain, to a person. And since it's connected to a person, very often it's connected to the person's CV or to the person's personal life. And so I decided, um, especially since many of you, of course, have, have ex at an extremely early age of their career, to tell a bit about my trajectory in life. Now, you may not guess it from my name, but I was born actually in Romania, in the western part of Romania, um, um, in 1962, um, with a German ethnic background. And this is because that part of Romania was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire before the First World War, so it was a culturally very mixed and religiously very mixed uh, um, uh, environment. And, um, but it was communist Romania and uh, at the age of 13 I convinced my parents um, to take advantage of our German background and try to get out of the country and uh, move to West Germany. And so after some struggle we managed to do so and moved um, to a little town, not that little, but a mid-sized town called Ludwigshafen. It's um, on the River Rhine. And so we went there, we didn't have any relations, of course. Um, but we went there because we wanted to be west of the Rhine. My mother was a bit scared of, of a clash with the Soviet Union and, and she said, okay, we have to be west of the Rhine, that is safer. <laughs> that was her psychology. Um, <laughs> and I liked that place because it was for a different reason, because it was very close to Heidelberg. And I knew, of course, that Heidelberg is a famous university town and I wanted to study there. And so after getting my high school leaving certificate, um, I went to Heidelberg to enroll as a physics student. And as you can imagine, like most physics students, I was fascinated with, um, say, say, basic type of physics, like particle physics, relativity, and these very fashionable and fancy type of things. Um, but at the time, I had to make a decision whether I should yeah, uh, take this, subject for my PhD thesis on that subject, I must say I, I kind of lost courage. I talked to the to, uh, students that were older than me and I said, oh, you should never do that. You should not become a theoretical physicist and definitely not a particle physicist because you're, you're likely, uh, the probability of getting unemployed, unemployed without job and so on would be very high and, and you end up uh, miserable and this kind of thing or, or a taxi driver. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> And this made the lasting impression on me because, as you can imagine, uh, we just had moved from, from here and we didn't have a strong social background. My father was threatened actually with his job, with threatened with unemployment. My mother was diagnosed with cancer and later died on cancer. And I thought, okay, um, if I should, since I'm an only child, I should do something that really earns me money, get me, gets me a job, 
And then I should do something that is applied and, and really gets me a job with a company like IBM or Siemens or so. And uh, this is what I looked like back then, believe it or not. Um, and uh, so for that reason, I signed up with this person who was a low temperature physicist who had just set up a startup company. And the startup company was specializing in building microscopes that were used, among others, for inspection of computer chips. And I felt, okay, if you do this inspection of computer chips for Philips or Siemens and Ole Hunt and these companies, and then in the end, um, you will get a job. And so I did that, and I did it, and after one year I realized, this is boring. <laughs> this is absolutely, this is not only boring, it's terrible. This is, this is microscopy, this is 19th century physics. I mean, there is nothing that you can invent or that you can come up with. There is no real phenomenon that you can use. It's, it's just, just boring. And so I almost became miserable, I must say. I had basically two choices. Well, I had to become miserable. And, and or quit my, my season. I was just about to do that. In fact, I shopped around to other places to, to get some another thesis. Or, and that was the other option, to ask the question, is there still something interesting in this boring subject of life microscopy, this 19th century subject that could be worthwhile pursuing? Is there still an interesting problem left after all? And at some point, I realized this, breaking the diffraction there, that would be cool, because everyone <laughs> thinks that it's impossible. And, uh, and, and, um, and so if, if one manages to do that, that would be something that would be worthwhile doing and it would be interesting. And at some point, um, this was during my PhD time, it was not my subject, of course, I realized it should be possible. And I'll tell you why. Because I said to myself, now this diffraction barrier was invented in 1873 or so, at the end of the 19th century. But so much physics happened, actually, and physical chemistry in the 20th century. So many new things were, were invented, like molecules were established, um, quantum mechanics was invented, spectroscopy, molecular states, all these things. Quantum optics. There must be something, at least one phenomenon, that is known, of course, in the literature, so to speak, that, that can, could get me beyond the diffraction barrier. They, I just have to find it. And so my philosophy was to, to, to screen textbooks and to find the phenomenon that gets me beyond the diffraction barrier. At some point I put it down in writing, so I realized that it won't work just by making the, the light focus sharper, that doesn't work. But maybe the, if one plays with the properties of the threads and molecules, you've seen these are molecules that we attach that could be a source um, uh, or provide a solution, or maybe there's some, some quantum optics effect. And so this was the philosophy that I had. And so I tried to convince, tried to speak about it to my thesis advisor, say, oh, it's not my field, I can't understand that, then to another person and so on. And in the end, I, I was threatened with unemployment, literally, and I was lucky uh, that I met a person who became a professor here in this remote place in Finland, in Turku, that I'd never heard of before. Um, and, um, and the person said, okay, you can come to, to my place, you have to help me setting up my startup company, which I gladly did, uh, with some advice. And uh, then you get some freedom to, 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 to pursue your ideas. And so I went in 93 to this place called Turku, which is actually quite a nice uh, uh, town in, in the southern Finland, in 93, with this idea in mind that there must be something that gets me beyond the diffraction barrier. And so when I was there, still with this idea in mind, in 93, one Saturday morning, again did what I always did, screen textbooks to find a, find a phenomenon. So I opened this textbook and I came across something that's called stimulated emission. This is a phenomenon every physics student learns in the first year. So it's very basic. It's a basic phenomenon used, for example, in the produ production of laser light. But you don't have to worry about that. It just uh, my eye got stuck, uh, struck actually by this word and then I was totally electrified, went to the lab to make some computation. There were no laptops in those days. I had to go to a desktop computer uh, to make initial assessments. And I realized that most likely I found at least one phenomenon that gets me beyond the barrier. The book, by the way, that is pictured here is, cannot be found in uh, the Bell Museum in Stockholm. And so you see that some coincidences can really make a difference. And uh, this is where I got the idea. 
And then I'm explaining now to you why I was so excited, why, why I felt that this phenomenon really can make a difference. Now you remember, we have the lens, we have this spot of light, of excitation light that is produced in here that excites all the molecules at the same time. All the molecules will produce light in here, and as I said, they will overlap, and this is the problem, you cannot tell it apart. And so this is the sample seen from the top, so this is the spot size from the top, and this is the molecule. Okay, we cannot change that. We cannot change the fact that you have this spot of light and it's finite size, and you cannot change the fact that all the molecules here are flooded with light. But, and that's the point, what can be changed, and that's what I realized in that very moment, is the ability of those molecules that are flooded with these green lights of sending light back to the detector. So if you manage to put these molecules into a state in which they are not able to produce light here at the detector, despite the fact that they are flooded with this green light, they're inevitably flooded with the green light, but if you put them in a state in which they're not capable of producing light here at the detector, a state in which they remain dark, then you can separate the bright ones, those that produce light in here, from those that can't, from those here. And so the idea was to put some of the molecules into a state, into a molecular state, in which they are not capable of producing light here at the detector. And so the key was to put molecules in a dark state, in a state in which they are not capable of producing light despite the fact that they are flooded with green light. And so this is why I'm circling into the state. So now you will ask, what is this dark state? Do molecules have such things as dark states? Well, well, let's have a look at this basic energy diagram. So this is something very simple. This is the energy ground state, this is the energy excited state up here. And the molecule, as I said, absorbs a photon when it's excited, goes from here to here, then comes down. Well, the excited state is not a dark state, obviously not, because if the molecule is in the excited state, it emits light, so it's a bright state. But what about the ground state? Well, it's very obvious, of course, the ground state is a dark state, because if the molecule is in a ground state, where it is usually, it's dark. And now guess what this phenomenon of stimulated emission does? It does nothing but push the molecule from the bright state to the dark state. It's a way of producing dark molecules. So whereas you can use light to turn molecules on to make them bright, you can also use light, and this is done by this uh, phenomenon of stimulated emission, you can use a beam of light that turns molecules off. You just do the opposite. And then you send the molecule back down to the dark state, you turn it off, and if you turn the molecules off here, and just keep the molecule here emitting, then we can separate this molecule out from the rest. So those are not a really only That's simple. And this is why, why I was so excited and, and realized this could make a difference in the area of light microscopy. And so um, you can imagine now roughly how this works. We have a lens, we have a sample, we have the detector, so there's nothing special in here. And we have the light for turning the molecules on, so getting them from the dark state, ground state to the bright fluorescent state, just excited by the absorption of a photon. And then, of course, that light will be spread out here, like Abe predicted. So it would, in principle, produce fluorescence of all the molecules in here. But now we also have something else. We have 